Good morning. It's so good to see you. Welcome to Providence Church. We're glad that each and every one of you are here. My name is Jacob Armstrong. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, as Mark said, we just had a, a wonderful morning. Each service, I've had a, a kid come through uh, Vacation Bible School or through Providence Kids who has given their life to Christ. So I love that that's just normal around here. <laughs> and um, we're so glad that you are here uh, today. I wanna read to you from the book of Luke, chapter nine. I'm gonna read verses 10 through 17. And then at the end of that, uh, I'll say this is the word of God for the people of God and we'll say together, thanks be to God. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away and the 12 came and said to him, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we're to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This picture I wanna show you is Elijah. He's sitting in a little covered concrete outpost near the main road in Cristo Rey, Belize. I think it was actually a bus stop, but we used it as a shaded area to do our crafts for the Vacation Bible School when our mission team from Providence Church was there last week. He's seven years old. Uh, he lives in Cristo Rey, which is a very small community on a road connecting two bigger cities in Belize, San Ignacio and San Antonio. It's right on the western border of Belize and Guatemala. It was 10.52 a.m. when I took this picture. We had just started snack time after about two hours of vacation Bible school, and I watched Elijah sit down and drink about two-thirds of his juice in one big gulp. The heat index was 109. And then he took this banana muffin we had given him. I saw him look at the muffin and then carefully wrap it up in the napkin in the paper towel there that you can see folded up there, and then he went back to his craft. Now, knowing that it was snack time, and the best time to eat your muffin is actually snack time, and there were a lot of other muffin eaters running around who I thought might prey upon it, I asked Elijah, what are you doing with your muffin? And he looked up and he said, I'm taking it home for my mom. And then I didn't ask him any more questions. I just sat and looked at him for a bit. It's actually when I took this picture, I realized that I could learn from him, from, from his heart, from his generosity, his sacrificial nature, and his compassion. That while he was at Vacation Bible School making a craft, getting a snack, while he was doing his thing, at the same time, he was thinking about somebody else somewhere else. I don't really know what was on his mind that day or what he had noticed that morning at home. I actually have no idea. But I know that he chose not to eat his snack so that his mom could eat his snack and my heart began to swell with compassion, right? My compassion capacity was growing larger because of how large his compassion was. His compassion was contagious and I caught it. I'm still, I'm still afflicted right now. You know, there is within the capacity of all of our hearts the ability to notice that someone else needs something and then to do something about it. That's just sort of a human thing. I might call it a, a logical compassion. Right? That logically we can note there's someone who doesn't have something, that's the logical part. And then the compassion part is what can I do about that? What can I give? Listen to this verse again from Luke chapter nine, verse 12 says, now the day began to wear away. I love that language, but all it's saying is uh, the sun's going down, right? The day is ending, time is running out. And the 12 disciples came to Jesus and said, send the crowd away, Jesus to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get food, for we are here in a desolate place. The disciples had noticed something 
And they had noticed that the 5,000 or so, probably more, who were gathered were hungry. They also had no food. And to get food, they'd have to go somewhere else. So they say to Jesus, uh, what they actually do is they bring a plan to Jesus. And they say, here's our plan, Jesus. Let the crowd go. The sun's going down. Uh, They'll actually have to go to multiple villages to feed this many people. We need to get this going right now. And there, they'll be able to find the food they need, and they'll find a safe place to sleep. The disciples are doing a very good thing by using their logical compassion to try to serve the people that are around them. But notice that their way of meeting the needs of the people in their midst is getting the need out of their sight. And this is rarely, if ever, how Jesus will work. But it's often our first inclination, isn't it? It's not bad at all. Just to say, I don't have what I need to help these people, but I could maybe help get them to the place where they could get help. We do this all the time, and it is a good thing. Jesus is just going to suggest something else because he's not only interested in feeding all the people, he's also interested in teaching the disciples, and he's also interested in showing them who he really is. And so Jesus says something different. They say, hey, here's the plan. We'll go get some food or we'll go send these people to get food. And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Fantastic Jesus answer, classic Jesus answer because it makes you stop and say, "Uh, come again? There's 5,000 men, which is not counting women and children. So most scholars think there's seven, 8,000 people. Nobody had to say that. In fact, in the story, nobody says how many people there are there. They just know they are looking at them. I mean, I've been so like pumped today because I think Providence Church forgot that it was the middle of July and the summer and we've been packed all morning. But imagine this room times 10 and that many people whose bellies are rumbling, and Jesus says, you give them something to eat. I told you there's a capacity within us to notice people in need. There's also a capacity within God, within Jesus, when he notices us noticing others, and what Jesus usually does is something more than we would imagine. That's the definition of a miracle in a lot of ways. When Jesus notices us noticing someone else, and then rather than using our plan, he does something more than we could imagine. So the disciples respond logically. He says, you give them something to eat, and they say, we have five loaves and two fish. That's all they got. And so they say, are you suggesting we go on a shopping trip? Because that's the only way that we can feed these folks. Here's the verses again. It says, but he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are gonna go and buy food for all these people, which is not practical. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, he prays over them, he said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd and they all ate and were satisfied and what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. So. Jesus prays over the the bread and the fish. They start handing them out and they just keep handing out bread and fish. It just keeps handing out, keeps handing out. Imagine, they've had all the people sit down in groups of 50 and whatever time that took, you guys getting 50, you guys getting 50, they get this huge crowd sitting down and then this starts to happen. It says they not only ate, they ate and they were satisfied. Their bellies were full and then the disciples gather up the bread that's left over and each disciple, there are 12 disciples and there are 12 baskets of bread that they bring back. So I did a little math. Uh, This is not hard math, it's my level math. And I did some math and when they started, the 12 disciples each had less than half a piece of bread per disciple. 43% of a piece of bread was the allotment for each disciple with their their, uh, five loaves. When they're done with whatever Jesus has just done, each one of them has a basket full of bread. There is a theory, a lot of, uh, you'll read this if you read commentators on the Bible who are uh, writing about the feeding of the 5,000, they'll say something like, perhaps what happened that day was a miracle in itself that the people, once Jesus started to share the meager amount that they had, they all began to pull out of their bags, their knapsacks, their bread or their fish that wasn't apparent when it first started. And so everyone began to share and it actually would be a miracle, uh, the miracle of sharing. It's, a, it's kind of a really beautiful thing to picture that people took what they had and then were able to take care of everyone else. It's a really beautiful picture. The only problem with it, it is definitely not what the scripture says happened. 
What the scripture says happened is there were five loaves of bread and two fish and Jesus prayed over them and then all of a sudden they, they went out. So I've actually, I've been to Tagba, which is on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee where this miracle took place, where they've marked it since it happened and there's a church that is built there. It is not named the Church of Sharing. That's not the name of the church. The name of the church in Tagba where this took place is the Church of the Multiplication of the loaves and the fish. <laughs> and people come from all over the world. In fact, the last time I was there, we couldn't, we couldn't even get our bus in. People come from all over the world, not because a bunch of people shared, which is a beautiful thing, but because something happened because of the capacity of God's power that was witnessed by his people and then passed down and passed down and passed down. And so I, I wanna lift up these, these two kind of um, these two kind of things happening in this story and neither one of them is like, I'm not trying to say one is bad and one is good. They're both really good, one is better, okay? What Jesus does when he says, you give them something to eat, is something that Jesus does over and over and over. And it is oftentimes when his followers, like us, are thinking one way, it may not be a bad way of thinking, but what he really wants us to see is his power. He will say something so startling, so unexpected, that it, it shifts us, it shuffles the deck so quick that you go from thinking one thing to the next, like this. There's all these people who are hungry. The only way they could be fed is if we get them to multiple villages where there could possibly be enough food to feed seven or 8,000 people. Jesus, this is our plan. He says, you give them something to eat. And you're like, whoa, 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 all right. Everything shifted. And what Jesus is, is trying to tip them over is to move from this logical compassion, which is good, to a miraculous mindset, which is the mindset of the followers of God all the time. So let me, let me show you kind of what I'm talking about. Logical compassion leads to plans. And some of y'all like, how many of you guys like to make a plan? You're the planner. God bless you. We, we pray over you uh, and give thanks for you in Jesus' name. You're so helpful in every way. Um, <laughs> So we have people that make plans, they're good. Um, churches love to make plans. Logical compassion leads to plans and it's, the seed of logical compassion is so beautiful. It's how homeless shelters come, child sponsorship programs and um, you know, uh, how we feed people. It's all kinds of things start that way. But a miraculous mindset leads to prayer. So plans are great and you need to make plans but when someone comes to me with a dream on their heart, I will disappoint them quickly because I'll, 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 and I want, you to, I want you to bring those dreams, but I just want you to know what I'll say to you is, okay, I want you to take that and I want you to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. And it's disappointing initially, why? Because you are ready for action and action is a good thing. Uh, um, logical compassion leads to action. But if by planning you skip praying, you will get great results, but possibly miss a miracle. Miraculous mindsets always pray. They pray and they pray and they pray. And that's what Jesus did. He started praying over five loaves of bread and two tilapia. That's what he prayed over. He's like, this is what we've got? Okay, can you imagine? They got them all seated. How long did it take them to get 8,000 people seated in groups of 50? Get them all calmed down and get them all listening. When they know the day is over, you guys are so, so lucky. I, uh, Jesus probably preached all day. You know, you guys get like 20 amazing minutes and that's it, right? He, they were ready for it to be done. And Jesus takes the bread and the fish, he starts praying over it. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for the five loaves of bread. Count them, one, two, three, four, five. And these two fish, do, do you ever, are you ever somewhere when someone's praying over food and you wish they would get to serving the food. Amen, right? When I got real fired up for Jesus and I was a young man, my buddy BC, told, I asked him, I said, hey BC, can we pray over the food? He said, you can pray over the food but do not pontificate over the food, right? <laughs> and here is Jesus, but he's doing it for a reason. He's trying to get them to see what they actually have. And he prays the blessing and then after the prayer, the prayer leads to a release of what God can do. So logical compassion leads to action. A miraculous mindset leads to release. Release what God can do. That happens through prayer. A release uh, from what God to do. That uh, we can make plans and we can execute them and we will get results and we will get credit for the results. But prayer, even though it delays the action sometimes, it always gets better results. Logical compassion results in results. 
And I am in favor of the brains of faithful people noticing need and acting in compassion. I am in favor of what that little boy did that day where his mind and his heart noticed something and he said, I'm gonna take what I have because there's someone else that, in, that is in need. That, those are good results, but a miraculous mindset leads to praise. I just want you to see the difference. When you get to the end, you're praising God for what God has done and that's always better than noticing what we have done. You cannot convince me otherwise. I've had experience with both of them. It's really cool to see results and say, man, we executed that plan. It's a totally different thing when we say, there was no way that was gonna happen outside the power of God, and so we give him all the credit. I'm gonna tell you a story I've told some of you guys before, and what I want us to grow into is when I tell a story that I've told before, y'all come to the edge of your seat and say, tell it again, pastor, okay? So uh, I've told you this story before, but some years back, over a decade ago or more, I was in a, another little uh, village in Central America called Los Cerritos in Nicaragua. And I, I was there because this com particular community, it had 70, 80 families, several hundred people, but they had no access to clean water. And so with my eyes, I got to see the effects that people have when they don't have something as simple as access to clean, healthy, safe drinking water in their community. And one day they took me down to this um, water source where they got their water. It was a creek, it was murky, and we had five gallon buckets and just kind of stagnant water. We're putting these five gallon buckets and I was with the women of the community because that's who would get the, the water. And I put it on my shoulder and walk, went to walk up this embankment and I couldn't make it all the way up the embankment with that big thing of water on my shoulder. And I sat down, I had to put the bucket down to take a breath, to take a break, you know? And I just started crying. I was like, I can't believe this situation. I can't believe that, that, that this is happening because I had just been in the back of a truck on the way there and heard someone say, you can actually put a well in Los Cerritos for $10,000. I was like, $10,000, you know? And so logically, you know, the compassion in me felt like we should do something. And I also felt an impression from the spirit. I felt like God told me while I was sitting there, go back and ask the church for $10,000. That makes sense, right? And so I popped up with a different mindset and I uh, got on a plane, I was flying home. And as I was flying home, uh, I started making a plan. I started planning because I started feeling a little nervous because uh, at that particular time, I don't do this anymore, but at that particular time, I'd been asking the church for money for other stuff, right? And I thought maybe this would conflict with that. We were trying to build a building. It was all those kind of things. And I said, I came up with a plan. Here, here's what I came up with. I determined, I did a little math, and I determined that if everybody who came to worship at Providence Church that day in West Wilson Middle School, if every person there spent what they were gonna spend on lunch and gave it for the well, we'd have $10,000. And you know what that is? That is a really good plan. That's what that's called. And so I, was, I came to church that next Sunday, you know, kind of a little bit of a, you know, my, you know, I was feeling pretty good about myself because I had the plan. And I was walking up this ramp. We had used to get to the school so early. And I'm coming up this ramp and I felt God, the same voice that spoke to me in Nicaragua in my heart, I felt God say to me, do not share that plan. <laughs> and I was like, it's a really good plan. I will execute it perfectly. And so I went and I preached a sermon that day that's probably, was probably as memorable as this one. And uh, <laughs> I, mean, I don't remember what it is. And then uh, I finished and I didn't share the plan. I just said, I told him about Los Cerritos and I said, I felt like God asked me to come back today and ask for $10,000. And I walked down the steps and I went and stood under this wildcat that was emblazoned on the wall underneath the basketball goal. We were having communion and a guy came from back over there all the way over to me and he put in my hand $10,000 that he had been prepared to bring that day. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. And um, here's what I thought, here's what I thought. I thought, I'm so glad I didn't share my plan because that dude would have given me eight bucks, <laughs> right? And something happened in my heart as a pastor. I'd seen miracles, our church has experienced the miracles in people's lives, but this was a leadership moment for me. And it changed the way I looked at being a, a pastor and overseeing the finances of the church. And that is, yes, we will plan. We will plan well. We will do our best, but we will pray. And we will pray for the release of God's power because what I realized is it was so much better to see what God could do in that moment outside of my spend what you were gonna spend at Subway plan. And what happened the next week is by the next week we had $80,000. 
And by the next week, we had $100,000. And if you go to Los Cerritos today in the northwestern corner of Nicaragua, a community that had never had access to clean water, you will find not just a well, but a pumping station and a tank on a hill and water, gravity-fed system feeding every home in Los Cerritos that kids in their own home turn on faucets and get water. And the girls who used to have to carry the water are now going to school. And the kids who were dying from diabetes are now healthy and going to, to their school. And this whole shift and change has happened. And nobody in Los Cerritos is saying that we're so glad the church in Mount Juliet shared. They are saying God took care of us. God did something here. God showed up in our place. And I think... I think that's why Jesus took those five loaves and those two fish and made everybody sit down and said, we're gonna pray over this so that there was no way that anybody could look back on what happened and not think that their God had the capacity to do more than their plans. So the takeaway from this, it's very practical and it's not hard, everybody can do it. The takeaway is simply this, take your plans to Jesus, planners, plan. If you're feeling compassion, feel it. If it's logical, we have this and we can give it to them, go with it. But make sure you, the plan gets to Jesus. The, the great thing about the disciples and what Jesus was showing them is it's not your plans that matter, it's your proximity that matters. The fact that the disciples were close to Jesus meant that any plan they made, they're gonna be like, hey Jesus, here's the plan for feeding folks. And then Jesus was able to keep the same, I love this about Jesus, he keeps the same aim, the thing that they wanted to happen, happened, but it happened through the power of God. And that changes, that's, that's what becomes a movement uh, amongst people who follow God. So I have been praying, this is ridiculous, but uh, I've been praying over Elijah's banana nut muffin. And I've been praying, oh God, thank you for that muffin. Thank you for that little boy. Bless it, bless him, bless his family, bless Christo Ray. I don't know what's gonna happen there. After the last service, I got a WhatsApp from a person in Cristo Ray. And they said, we loved the service. And so what I'm praying is that maybe his thing, the thing that he had in his hands that he offered could be multiplied. And what I wanna invite you to think about are what plans did you bring in the room today? What are you planning for your kid? What are you planning for your, you know, your health? What are you planning for your business? And would you be willing to be in enough close proximity to Jesus to say, hey, here's the plan, uh, here's the plan, what do you think? And it's likely that Jesus might say something to you um, that's a bit different than the plan where he can accomplish the aim in a way that magnifies the power of God in your life. How cool would that be? He can do it, he will do it, uh, amen.